All right, now really pleased to be joined by a returning member and a Canadian born member of the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, and that, of course, is right handed pitcher Landon Barasa. Right now, actually joining us from San Francisco, California. Landon, uh, great to catch up with you. Really excited that you'll be coming back for another season with the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, and uh, just thanks so much for taking the time out here this evening. Well, Steve, of course, man. I'm happy to, happy to be here. Good to re- reconnect with you, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Well, you had a, a huge impact uh, on the Winnipeg Gold Eyes last year, just coming in straight out of college. Uh, uh, just kind of, if you can, uh, maybe recap. Uh, 2021, you, know, you finish up your career at, at the University of San Francisco. You have a, a really an historic uh, a career for the Dons and uh, joining the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, getting your pro career started, and uh, you, you really just seem to hit the ground there running for the Gold Eyes. Yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely a fun year. I mean, top to bottom start to finish all the way competing from February when the college season starts until the end of the American Association uh, season out in September. I mean, it was a long year, but it was, it was a ton of fun. And, and just, I can't thank you and, uh, and Rick enough for the opportunity of bringing me out there and, and just getting a chance to, to get my feet wet at the professional level and, and get the opportunities that I did. It was just a ton of fun experience to hop into and the travel, of course, right off the bat. But, I mean, it was, it was, like I said, it was a pretty long season, but at the end of the day, I'm really glad I did it, and, and it was just, it's been a great experience thus far, and I can't wait to go back, and of course, you know, getting the opportunity for us to be back in Winnipeg, like, that was such a lift at that point in the season with how long all of us had been, had been competing, but myself especially, I've been, been uh, competing since February. And, you know, it was really interesting, uh, you know, your first uh, couple outings there were, were the team was still in, in Jackson, Tennessee, but uh, when the goal lines finally got home, to Winnipeg on August 3rd, it, w- it was kind of unique that you were the guy that started that game uh, in front of the big crowd, and, and there had been so much anticipation with uh, the Gold Eyes having not played a real home game at that point in almost two years. So uh, just what was that experience like for you as someone that, that's from Canada, born in Alberta, to um, kind of help reopen Shaw Park, so to speak, there uh, last August? I mean, that was... It was phenomenal. I mean, I only heard good things about the crowd and the kind of support that we got in Winnipeg. And and when I think we were in uh, Sioux Falls or Sioux City, and, and Rick just kind of said, hey, you're, you're starting game one when we get back. And I was like, oh, man, this is going to be – like, that's pretty fun and exciting. And I remember it mainly for the reason that that was the first time that my mother had gotten a chance to see me pitch in almost three years. And, you know, it was just a really exciting time. Not only – well, I hadn't even seen her in almost two years, so – I remember it for a little bit, for a bunch of different reasons, really. I mean, part of it was getting a chance to see her and pitch in front of her again, but at the same time, too, being Canadian, having that that responsibility to, to open up, you know, back at Shaw Park like that, it was just a ton of fun, and I'm glad, obviously, I remember that well because we had a win in that game and everything, and, and just a great crowd and a great atmosphere. You know, I'll ask you a couple of questions here about, uh, you know, the experience level in, in the league. First, uh, you know, as someone coming straight into college the way you did, uh, just w- what can you say about the Gold Eyes Clubhouse, kind of getting to, to know some guys that have played at really high levels? Uh, you know, Donnie Hart had gotten all the way to the major leagues. Uh, a lot of guys in last year's team that reached double A AA or triple A and had some incredible seasons. Uh, what was that like for you uh, as you kind of maneuvered through the clubhouse and, and started to learn the professional game? Well, I think the obvious answer there is just, the wealth of experience of the guys around me. I remember Donnie obviously being a pretty big contributor there too, and and having Bud Norris there for that the first two weeks when we were back in Jackson, just getting to pick his brain. I mean, he was from out here in San Francisco, San Francisco Bay Area, so him and I had some connections and and getting to chat about some things. But at the end of the day, I mean, I went from being the oldest guy on my college team to being basically the youngest guy on the team in Winnipeg, and just you know, I tried to keep my mouth shut and my ears as as uh, open as possible and just taking as much information as I could. And and we just had a great supporting cast of so many guys that had so many different experiences, whether it be at a high level on the international stage like Wes and, and Seeds or guys that had played in the major leagues or double-A, triple-A. So it's just fun to, to see those guys, the way they go about their process, the way they kind of handle their day-to-day business, and, and also just their pure talent and abilities on the field too. It was a lot of fun. And, and I just just got to learn a ton from all that experience around me. Landon Barasa, returning Gold Eyes pitcher, originally from Lethbridge, Alberta, our guest right now on the latest edition of the Inside Pitch. And uh, kind of piggybacking off that, uh, just for you, and, and what did this do for, for your confidence? Uh, you, you're also competing against uh, similarly 
experienced teams, uh, lineups like, you know, whether it was uh, a Sioux City or a Milwaukee, where there's guys that have been as high as the major leagues or a lot of guys with double A and triple A experience. Uh, what did that do for you and, and kind of your learning curve is uh, you were able to have some success against some really experienced hitters? Yeah, I mean, you know, baseball is baseball, and I and I think that that's something I kind of try to tell myself is, hey, if I go ahead and make my pitches, it doesn't matter who it's going to be against. I know my stuff's good enough. So from that standpoint, like it's definitely daunting, right? And you see some of those guys get in the box, and, and you know that, that they're experienced. You know that they know how to handle at bats, and you know that they can drive the ball to the ballpark at any time. So there's definitely an added challenge to it, but, I mean, I'm a competitive guy, and just getting to have the opportunity to compete against guys who've who played at a higher level and have way more experience than myself. I mean, it's just something that I relished in and I, I had a lot of fun doing it, but it definitely, that was in my mind, the best part of, of the league and getting to play is just the wealth of experience. I mean, my team, you know, with the gold eyes and, and the other teams too, and really just everybody, like it was, it was good fun. It was really good quality baseball. And that's, that's what I set out to try to challenge myself with. So I'm glad it worked out that way. You know, one of the most impressive things about uh, the success you did have with the Gold Eyes there at the end of the season, you, you had thrown so many innings uh, during your, your senior season at the University of San Francisco, uh, just under, under 100 innings, uh, a little over 40 more once you, once you got to Winnipeg. Uh, so, so what's your off-season preparation been like? Uh, kind of, uh, I would imagine, maybe a little bit of a, of a reset button once that season had finished up w- with the innings. Uh, uh, how has that kind of factored into what you've been doing uh, to get ready here for 2022? Oh, yeah. No, that was, I mean, definitely the highest volume year that I'd had, especially being that that'd be my first full true season coming off of Tommy John surgery. So as soon as the season ended, I basically took the next two months and and just did not touch a baseball. It was a bit of a mental reset, kind of allow my body to get back into it for the first few weeks before I got back into the weight room again. And, and just going forward, knowing what it took to be able to throw about 150 innings in a year like that, I mean, it it just kind of sets the tone and sets the uh, the standard for my off-season training. And so that's been a ton of fun where I, I kind of said, hey, that's that's an area of my game I really need to improve is adding physical strength. And so I've just targeted that. And it's been really, really nice to not have that college schedule where you're expected to play fall ball games and then you're expected to start your season again in February where I've been able to really have a nice, long, drawn-out ramp-up where – Hey, by the time I show up in camp, just like Rick had told me, he says, hey, be ready to throw six innings. And so I've basically got my, my sights set on that at this point and, and been able to be here in San Francisco throwing live ABs, throwing bullpens, working out every day, all that kind of stuff. I've really had a one-stop shop here with, with my alma mater, and so it's been a good situation so far. And I, I'm going to be ready. I feel great physically. And, yeah, I mean, there's not really not much else to it, but it, it's been fun. It's been an adventure thus far in my first full pro off season. And, you know, re- really uh, uh, just a cool experience, I, I would imagine. Uh, you played uh, initially at a junior college, but you end up spending uh, uh, four years uh, at the University of San Francisco. So just, you know, ha- having grown up in, in Western Canada, what was that like to kind of spend uh, that much time with not only a great program, but to, in, in really what's considered one of the best cities in the world? Oh, my goodness. It felt like a four-year vacation at times, <laughs> honestly. I mean, I know I was there to, to study and and play ball and everything but at the end of the day just the experiences that i got as a human and as a person to to live in basically like you said one of the best cities in the world and and especially right now in terms of the job market and and uh everything else with the silicon valley and the tech boom i mean it's just fantastic to see everything around you moving at such a vibrant pace and and having to understand where you fit into that and and just kind of keep my head on straight for the last four years and and being here has been a ton of fun and i kind of made a home here in a sense right and that's why i'm that's why I'm back. That's why I'm trying to give back to the program as best I can and help lead some of the young guys that are here that I get to see every day. And, and yeah, I mean, the city's just fantastic. I wish everybody could experience it because it really is. It's, <laughs> there's nothing like it. I mean, going from Lethbridge, which is about a city of 90 or 100,000, to San Francisco, where there's more people in the Bay Area than there is in the entire province of Alberta. I mean, it's it's a real adjustment, but I mean, that was part of the draw of, of coming here for me at the time. So it, it really did work out very well, too, for me. And you mentioned you, you had to overcome Tommy John surgery. And, of course, you know, really everyone's lives were, were disrupted uh, as a result of the pandemic starting in 2020. But, uh, you know, I guess if there was any silver lining, it, it, it kind of bought you another 
couple years there of eligibility. So, you know, you got to, you know, experience that last year in 2021, but uh, it allowed you to get some more education where you not only finished your undergrad degree, but uh, you actually got your master's as well. Uh, just uh, how important was that to you to kind of take advantage of that opportunity? Oh, I mean, that was, that was huge because initially when I got in the herd, it was my fifth year of college. And, you know, there's a lot of guys that, that just kind of hang it up when they get to that point. And, and I had elected to come back for that, that one year that I had remaining. And it was a two-year master's program. And I knew that going in. And I just said, hey, well, I'll do year one. And, and hey, maybe I come back as a coach sometime and finish it. Or maybe I come back just as a student at some point in time, too. But I really had no idea what was going to go. I just knew that, hey, I wanted to keep playing. And I might as well start the grad program. And then, like I said, really, for as tough as it's been on everybody and myself included, just getting another year of eligibility where I was able to complete my master's degree in sport management, I, I don't think it could have gone any better. And I'm, I'm extremely fortunate, in all honesty, as, as tough times as that was. But it also allowed me to come back for last year and be completely healthy before going back into the college season. And then, of course, on the professional ranks where, like I said, if I, you know, the year before, I probably wouldn't have been able to handle throwing that many innings. But luckily, you know, it bought me another year of school, of time to train, all that kind of stuff. And once again, I've been very fortunate with the way it's worked out. Landon Barraza joining us on the latest edition of the Inside Pitch. Uh, how excited are you, uh, not just to come back to, uh, to the Gold Eyes here for, for uh, the beginning of the 2022 season, but uh, you kind of look at how the, the team is shaping up at this point, and there are uh, quite a few uh, names that are going to be coming back that you had the opportunity to share the clubhouse with last year, whether it's guys like the Max Murphy or, or Kevin Lachance on the hitting side, or you mentioned Travis Seabrook, a, a fellow Canadian on the pitching side. How much are you looking forward to just kind of uh, uh, reconvene with some of those guys? Oh, that's and that's always just one of the pleasures of, you know, being in a locker room and sharing it with those guys. I remember uh, Kevin and and Murph. We kind of had this corner in the locker room, and so I got to know those guys a little bit, even though they're on the hitting side, and and uh, just getting to pick their brains, seeing the way they go about their business. Those are two very veteran guys that have really been around the block when it comes to professional baseball. So just getting to to see them every day, have conversations spend some time with those guys i mean it was it was a lot of fun for me last year and i felt like i was almost drowning in all the information i was getting from all different angles but this next year i mean coming back with a little bit more experience under my belt i'm looking forward to contributing some more to those conversations hearing what those guys have to say and then ultimately passing some of that on to the new guys we're going to get because at some point there's going to be guys that come in fresh off their college season just like i had this past year well, outstanding stuff, Lan. I know it's a busy time for, for everybody. Uh, just uh, before we let you go, any uh, any words you might want to have for the Gold Eyes fans that are listening before we get to see you here in a little over a month? Well, I mean, just thank you, thank you, thank you for the way things went last year and everybody standing by us and supporting us. And There's not really much else to say other than I'm really excited to, to see in a packed house when we get back to Shop Park in May. Well, out, outstanding stuff. Thanks so much again for the time, Landon. Uh, all the best to you and your family here moving forward, and I uh, look forward to seeing you on May 5th. Of course, Steve. My pleasure. The longtime manager of the Winnipeg Gold Eyes, and that, of course, is Rick Forney joining us from Maryland. Rick, uh, always great to catch up with you. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time out, and uh, just uh, how's it been going here the last couple of weeks? Hey, Steve. Thanks for having me. Things are going well. Weather's finally breaking here. Uh, allergies are going crazy so that means the trees are popping and the grass is starting to grow so it must mean baseball's right around the corner but things are going well just uh trying to get the rest of my roster solidified here it's been a little bit slow going but uh we're plugging away at it you know no doubt the weather is uh has certainly turned here for the better the last couple of weeks and uh, maybe the biggest news certainly across baseball uh, since the last time we caught up is uh, the, the lockout in Major League Baseball has ended. Spring training is, is fully underway and uh, looks like the MLB regular season is going to be played in full 162 games. They'll be getting underway that first or second week of April. Uh, I've got to imagine for, for you and, and all the other managers, uh, th this is a very uh, positive thing, certainly a positive thing for, for baseball fans. And uh, it looks like it'll hopefully kind of restore something of a normal timeline, which we really haven't had here the last couple of years. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing here is that we're going to play baseball. We're going to play a full season. We got the, They got this over with it everything worked out and uh we'll get a full 
season for for the players' benefits, for the fans' benefits. It's just uh, the game has been altered a little bit, as we all know, the last couple of years, and you know things are finally seeming like it's slowly getting back to to normal. So you know we want that full baseball season, a chance to go out and enjoy the, the weather in, in, to, in these nice full ballparks, and we want minor league kids to have full seasons like like they've had in the past. Just I can't think of a more difficult time to be a minor league baseball player than the last couple of years. Kind of hard to continue to make this a career choice when there's so many uncertainties. You basically put your life on hold. So thank goodness they got everything worked out and uh, guys will be able to play ball and um, we can do the things that we like to do. You know, part of the, the lockout uh, c- coming to an end, they kind of shored up the different elements of the new collective bargaining agreement. And uh, we saw this last year, and it looks like they're going to continue the, the later draft where, you know, for the longest time, the, the draft for, for amateur players, college, high school, took place that first weekend or first week in June. Last year, they shifted it about a month later where it came during the month of, of July, which is about the halfway point of the American Association season. Uh, uh, they'll be doing that again, it looks like, here in 2022. And uh, just kind of your thoughts on that, how it may affect, uh, you know, uh, positively or negatively, uh, the ability of you and the other managers to maybe find so- some reinforcements uh, once the season kind of gets underway. Well, negatively, it, it, it affects us. If we need some people to come play, some of these kids are going to wait till the draft and they're not going to be available to join up with us, much like last year the better ones are going to choose to wait but I think from a positive standpoint two things happen Um, that draft being a little bit later um, allows some young player that's on the fence whether they're going to stay or go another month or two of audition time to prove that they belong in an organization and not not being released or traded or whatever the case may be um that the draft took place in the beginning of June and guys were reporting in the third week of June to start a rookie ball season and somebody was going to be getting dumped in. So with the draft happening a little bit later, then it's going to get somebody you know, a little bit extra audition time, which I, you know, I think is important for these kids, especially now that they've been robbed of so many games of their career in the last couple of years. And I mean, let's face it, some of these kids that are getting drafted, they've, you know, played a, 52 college game season, thrown a lot of innings, had a lot of at bats, or high school kids had a pretty thick schedule. But you know, trimming trimming down that uh, length of their first initial season in Pro Bowl, I don't think I don't think that uh, I don't think that hurts them in any means. Probably keeps some people from getting hurt. And, um, there's still creative ways to get those guys baseball work during their first year of professional baseball. Yeah, it might be just a, a shortened season. Um, but, you know, if they can get these kids into an instructional league situation where they can get another month or two in the fall um, before they shut down for the winter, I think that helps. But, um, you yeah, know, I, I don't think – at the end of the day, I think it's a good thing that the draft is a little bit later. But um, for indie ball, I mean, I'm just going to hurt for some people trying to get some players. Joined by Winnipeg Gold Eyes manager Rick Forning and opening day uh, coming up sooner rather than later Friday – May 13th at home against the Fargo Moore at Red Ox. Gold Eyes uh, will be playing a full home schedule uh, for the first time here since 2019. A couple of player signings since uh, the last radio show. We'll start with a guy that I think was, uh, you know, a favorite of yours and really a favorite in the clubhouse for the way he went about his business as a younger player. But uh, Dakota Connors did a fantastic job as uh, your utility infielder last season. A, a lot of versatility on the defensive side and uh, really had a nice finish to, to the year there offensively. Yeah, he's a good baseball player, and he's a good kid, good person, well liked. Everybody loved this kid, and um, just a real good, positive attitude every day. I mean, he was playing every day for us when the season started, and it was a little bit tough, maybe unfair, that he had to jump right in there. But um, he did a good job, and um, I'd like to try to find ways to play him, or he's going to get an opportunity, obviously, early in the season to play a lot. But with our schedule looking the way it is, that uh, it's going to be cold, and we're going to we're going to have to be creative and find ways to get guys off their legs. I don't think anybody's going to be able to start that season and play seven, eight, ten straight days without days off. I think you're going to have to be creative and move some guys around and give people DH days or days off just so we can avoid possible leg injuries. And you know, when it's cold and damp in Winnipeg, which we're going to start there for two. 
weeks, then we're going to go to the Milwaukee area. It's going to be cold and damp there. Then we go back to Winnipeg. Uh, you're going to take a lot of things into consideration, and players' health, not just the pitchers, is going to be one of those. And, uh, the last thing you want is a calf injury or a hamstring injury or a quad injury, groin or whatever, where a guy's going to be out for three weeks a month. You know, if we can find a way to try to avoid those by building in a couple off days, I believe we're going to try to do that. You know, one of the things that uh, it was really just kind of, I guess, from a standpoint, just kind of talking to Dakota on a on a day to day basis yesterday. Just it, what really one of the things that really stood out was that he was always, he was always trying to learn. He was always picking the brains of, of some of the you know the more older or veteran type players, whether it was position players or, or pitchers, and uh, just always asking questions. And it seemed like he was really committed to uh, trying to get better each day. He's a baseball guy. He loves the game, and he's out there to learn. He plays hard and. I think, you know, that's why he plays well. I think he had, obviously had some good people uh, to watch and learn from in, in terms of their pregame preparation. I mean, who the heck prepares better than Kevin LaChance and Tyler Hill? You just watch those guys work every day. Kyle Martin, um, they work hard every day in preparation for games. And so he's around some good people. But I, I think Dakota just loves the game uh, and likes everything about him and, and wants to know how to get better every day. It's, it's, I think just out of his own curiosity, I don't think he looks at anybody and says, hey, you're better than me. What can you, what can you teach me? It's not one of those deals. I think he's just, he likes baseball and he wants to learn from everybody. And, you know, he knows that somebody might be able to offer something that's going to click for him and make him a better baseball player. But he can play, he can, he can hit, he can defend, he can do a lot of things around the base as well. He's, he's a good young baseball player. And uh, you brought in a, a really high upside young left-handed pitcher here by the name of, of Jalen Smith. He had uh, three seasons in the Phillies organization, but he still has um, a rookie classification in the American Association. Uh, just uh, your thoughts here, and uh, left-hander Jalen Smith. Yeah, it's just looking for a younger, hungry kid that still fits that rookie LS1 classification. Um, you know, with, with Seabrook and Strobel, we have two lefties that we're going to lean on late in the game um, but we need, I felt like we needed another left hand and probably get it from the rookie classification but um, he's got some upside, he's young um, it's, 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 you're going to have to nurture him a little bit and bring him along but the skill set, the talent it's there, he's got a, a good arm, the velocity is good, he was 89-92 in spring training um, it gets a little better than that once that adrenaline starts going during the season. So anytime you got a chance to add a, a good left-handed arm that's got a little bit, a bit of velo and somebody that's hungry and really wants to be there and play in our league, then I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm excited to bring them along. Go Lights manager Rick Forney joining us here on the March 21st edition of the Inside Pitch and CGNU. 93.7 FM. Uh, you, you alluded to it uh, just a, a bit ago about the, the weather, and it, it just it could be a challenge with with starting in Winnipeg, all of training camp in Winnipeg, and the first road trip. Uh, you know, not necessarily being in, in that much of a, a warmer climate out there in the Milwaukee area. Um, yeah, I know how much uh, speed has kind of been an important part of, of the Gold Eyes game here, especially some of the better teams and better offenses that you've had. Is, is that a situation where you've really got to? Um, I, I, I guess maybe even look at the field, see how damp and, and, and what the feel or the dirt is uh, once we kind of get underway in the regular season. Because I would imagine you want to try and tap into that running game as much as possible, but at the same time maybe be cognizant, yeah. as you said, about uh, trying to prevent injuries. Well, we want to run. We're not going to not run because we're trying to prevent injuries. We, we are who we are. We just got to take care of ourselves before and after games and things like that. I mean, it's going to be chilly, but the game – you know, the game would be a played a little bit slower just because the air is going to be cold. But, um, you know, we're going to try to do what we do offensively and make some things happen with our legs, whether it's 50 degrees outside or 80 degrees outside. We're going to do whatever we can to help produce offense. And being good base running teams, don't that doesn't slump, you know what I mean? Hit slumps a little bit, gets hot and cold. But if you can run the base and be a good base running team, then that helps you score an extra couple runs a night. Sometimes that's going to be the difference of winning and losing. So, to me, that's just as important as defending the field or having some quality pitchers out there. Uh, being good base runners makes a difference. You know, one thing we haven't touched on yet, but a fairly significant uh, change or addition, however you want to look at it, to the American Association this year. But uh, they're going to. 
bring back the international tiebreaker rule where uh, in extra innings they'll place the runner on, on second base, uh, similar to what uh, Major League Baseball had done uh, last season. I know the American Association tinkered with it on 2015 or 2014 and 20. 15 but uh you know I, I know it's not traditional baseball but but maybe it, it could be a good thing uh this year just given uh, the uncertainty of, of how much pitching might be available but uh, your thoughts on how that might affect how you uh, approach well, the game in the later innings yeah i think that's just gonna i think that's just a byproduct of us trying to protect arms and based on what happened last year uh, losing a lot of quality arms and kind of feeling like Major League Baseball is looking to do business the same way, that when they have needs, they're going to take them from the indie ball rosters and never sure you know how many pitchers you're going to have available to you every day. So I think everybody was somewhat in agreement as to add this role just to try to shorten the games up a little bit to probably preserve some of the help of, of some of your pitchers on your staff. But, um, but those games are such a crapshoot. I think we've been lucky enough to win more in those situations than lose. But it all depends on how much of your pitching you spent to that point and what you have left. And, uh, you know, it's it's really hard to tell you how you, how you like to play it every day because I, I always felt I had a certain game plan going into it. But once you get into those situations, you have a couple of them each week. And they're all, they all seem to be different situations where you never have the same pitchers available to you. You never have the same types of hitters in the lineup coming up or, you know, it, there's a lot of things that are involved, but we've been fortunate enough in the past that memory serves me properly. I think we've won more than we've lost in those situations. So, uh, <laughs> hopefully if we got to play extra inning games this year, we'll be able to win more than we lose. Well, outstanding inside as always, uh, Rick, before we let you go, just, uh, any, um, uh, just kind of what what else maybe are you are in search for as you look to fill out the last uh, few roster spots between now and uh, the end of April? Uh, I'm looking for a center fielder, maybe two outfielders, and, and some pitching help. So um, we'll see what comes available here in the next couple of weeks. But uh, we still got some holes to plug, and we're going to work hard to do that. All right, Rick. Well, thanks so much as always for the time. Uh, all the best to you and the family, and I uh, look forward to catching up here in a couple of weeks. All right, Steve. I'll talk to you soon, bud. Take care. Really pleased to be joined by the uh, longtime manager now of the Sioux City Explorers and, of course, a former coach with the fargo Red Redhawks, and that, of course, is Steve Montgomery joining us from Tampa, Florida. Uh, Steve, always great to catch up with you. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time out here this evening. Hey, I'm excited to be here, man. Thanks for all you do and all the coverage and all the war and all that those stats you provide us man um we couldn't ask for a, a better radio guy and i appreciate you having me on the show well very much appreciate it now uh, we'll uh, just kind of ask you about the sioux city explorers uh last year of really the last two years for, for you guys very challenging uh, you're one of the teams that unfortunately couldn't uh, participate in 2020 as a result of the pandemic uh you're able to rally back last year got to the postseason uh the fifth time you've led the explorers to the playoffs uh, since taking over and that's the most playoff appearances of any team during that stretch in the American Association. Uh, how do you characterize uh, what you guys were able to accomplish in 2021? Well, it was obviously challenging as it was for, you know, all the teams in the American Association because of how much movement uh, there was uh, inside of our league as far as players getting picked up. And then you factored in that we weren't a participant um, in the 2020 season. So we had guys that literally took, you know, almost two years off of playing you had injuries, you had uh, roster turnovers with Major League Baseball picking up our guys. So it was definitely challenging, but, uh, you know, we, we found a way, um, and you got to credit the gentlemen in that, in that locker room and, and my coaches for the resiliency that they showed, and especially down the stretch when, you know, we were kind of on the outside in and uh, we had a really hot August and got ourselves back in the chase. And, um, you know, the baseball we played in the last two weeks, um, you, you couldn't ask for more. I mean, you know, we took three games in a row uh, to put ourselves, you know, in in a shot uh, before the last day of the season just to have a playoff shot. Um, and fortunately, we got some help from, you know, the Houston Apollos there on that last day and was able to sneak in. And, and uh, you know, we went down and, um, you know, Cleburne was a very good team. Um, we pitched incredibly well. Patrick Lede going five shutout and 
Um, Max Coons coming in. And Coons, he just, uh, you know, I can't remember how many innings Coons comes. If we went to Brochure, it's all a blur now. So, um, and then obviously ran into Kansas City, and Kansas City was very, very hot in the playoffs. Um, you know, I don't think anybody got Gabby Guerrero out there in the whole playoffs. And, uh, you know, just ran into a, we ran into a well oiled machine and, you know, early exit, not what we were looking for, but, you know, proud of the guys how they battled down the stretch and gave us a playoff run. Steve Montgomery, the manager of the Sioux City Explorers, our, our first guest on the latest edition of the Inside Pitch. Uh, a couple of games wanted to ask you about down, down that stretch. First, uh, maybe one of the biggest reasons you, you got in that series in Sioux Falls. You have a, a rookie pitcher straight out of college in Tyler Cook. Uh, in of all places, the birdcage, he goes out and, and throws a no-hitter. Uh, just how special is that to, to kind of watch that unfold, especially in what proved to be such a huge game? Well, yeah, I mean, here's the thing, and what's lost in the whole equation, and and if you're probably not at the game or with us, then you didn't know is that Tyler Cook was getting ready to come into the game because it was such a nip and touch game that first game, and they had a big lefty coming up. I can't remember who it was, maybe uh, Mikulczewski or something like that, that we wanted to flip him to the right side. So here we got Tyler Cook warming up in the bullpen. We get out of the situation. We win the game one. Um, I'm in the locker room. I have no idea because I had no, I couldn't name a starter because I had to win the first game. And you know, Cook walks through the walks through the door and says, "I want the ball." And I was like, "Tyler, you just you just warmed up." He goes, "I'm loose. Give me the ball." He goes, "I think I can go three or four. I go, "I go. Are you sure?" And he goes, "Yeah, I think I can." Well, next thing you know, three turns into four, and then we put up you know we put up some runs, and which was real pivotal. Pivotal, ah, pivotal in um, um, in that in that no hit bid because it gave us some cushion. And next thing you know, he's through five. Next thing you know, he goes out for the six, and I'm like, Bobby, I can't do this. Like, I and the pitch count was astronomical, and I'm going, oh my goodness, like I'm gonna hurt this kid's arm and stuff like that. But you know, after the sixth inning, I went down there, and I was like, H- how do you feel? He's like, I got it, and he knew what was going on. He goes, I got this. And then, sure enough, you know, you got to have that. You have to have that play. There's a play that you have to have, and that was Sermo's first out in seven. Hard hit ball down the third base line. Sermo backhands it, throws it to first base. We get it, we get him in time, and I was like, okay, this is meant to be. And I kind of relaxed at that point with, with an out in the seventh. I was like, you know what, he's going to get this. And then, sure enough, he was able to finish it. Um, you know, great story for him and um, something I'm sure he'll remember the rest of his life. I mean, how how – impressive is that you, know, you have a kid that's 22 23 years old straight out of college to you know basically tell you number one like you mentioned that you know, I, I want the ball that kind of old school mentality and then later on saying that hey I, I've got this even though he does have that that climbing pitch count uh, you know in a day and age where uh, starters just don't go nearly as deep in the games as, as they once did maybe five or ten years ago yeah you know I mean I think all of us now with all the you know, the weight room and stuff like that and how bigger and stronger these players are. All of our bells and stuff as managers go off about that, you know, 9,500 pitch count where it used to be 120, 125. You know, you can remember the days of Rich Hyde going out there throwing 132, 135. And uh, it, that's just not meant to be anymore. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, uh, I think he might have thrown in near 130, maybe even into the 140s that night. And, uh um, but you know, I, all of our players knew what was going on and, and it's crazy to watch a dugout, Steve. And I don't know if you're like this as well, when you're calling something like that, that all of a sudden you start doing the same things over and over every inning. And I made sure I was in the same spot. Once I realized like in the fourth inning, I'm like, Oh, he's got no hitter going. And you obviously you don't say it. And I'm like, Bobby, we got to be thinking about going. He's like, okay. And the next thing you know, we score a couple runs. He goes out there. Now he's got the no-hitter through the fifth. I'm like, okay, same spot, you know, and then the sixth inning, same spot. So, um, but it was real special for that kid, and, you know, I look forward to what he can do this year. And then the other game, just a few days after that, uh, you participated in the first ever wild card game, which is uh, really neat. Uh, you know, we've seen it the last eight or eight or nine years at the major league level. Uh, but to kind of put your entire season on there um, in kind of a, a Super Bowl March Madness, whatever analogy you want to use, but it's a, a one game playoff. And you mentioned you got the combined shutout from Lede and Coons, and you did it on the road in front of a, a pretty hostile crowd there down in Cleburne. Uh, just what was it like to kind of manage uh, just a sudden death winner take all a game like that? Well, yeah, it was definitely something that was new, obviously. Um, 
you know, it's kind of like put your eggs in one basket and, you know, you knew what you had to do. And, uh, you know, I credit my team a lot because, you know, we got on a bus that day from Sioux Falls heading down. You know, it's not an easy travel. It's, you know, 13 and a half, 14 hours from Sioux Falls. You know, we get in at like midnight the night before and, you know, you sleep and then you get up and um, it's winner take all. But, you know, we were able, you know, Sermo hit a big home run in the sixth, um, top of the sixth inning. Um, and then we were able to scratch another one across, and then Lane Milligan with a two two run homer that really I felt like solidified it. But it was a strange day in Cleburne. Um, obviously, the hostile crowd they thought you know some some they thought we had hit a guy on purpose and stuff like that, and that wasn't the case. And obviously, the fans are going to protect their guys. I get that, but the wind was blowing in from left and out to right, and, and I don't think I've ever seen that in Cleburne in all the years I've been there. Normally the wind's just howling out to left, and that really helped us um, because we were able to attack with a lefty, Patrick Lede. He was able to throw strikes and trust that, you know, if a ball got up to left, it wasn't going to go anywhere. And I think that that was really key uh, part of that game was the way the wind direction was blowing. Yeah, Max Coons finishes that game off. Uh, you mentioned the, the four shutout innings. He only gave up one base hit. Uh, he was my vote, actually, for uh, rookie uh, pitcher of the year last uh, last season, just based on what he had done. I know Nate Hadley had a great season, but uh, Coons was was unbelievable. Uh, just uh, how special was that to kind of see a, a younger, maybe less experienced guy just kind of thrive in a high leverage situation like that? It, it was great because here's a kid. Here's a kid that I picked up off of Twitter. I saw him throw on Twitter, and uh, I made like 17 phone calls to every Coons out in the Colorado till I was able to find somebody that had Max Coon's um, number. And, um, you know, he was a guy that, um, you know, had Tommy John surgery, uh, didn't come back from it, uh, was being a high school pitching coach, started throwing bullpens. Like, you know, he was 94, 95. So I thought, hey, why not give this guy a chance? I mean, what do I got to lose? Some travel money in. And he, he became one of the most dominant relievers in the league, I felt. Um, you know, we put him in any situation, whether it was closing. You know, once we lost Pobreco, we kind of closed by committee a little bit. We uh, did some stuff out of the norm, and it didn't matter if I gave Max the ball in the third inning, the fifth inning, seventh, or ninth. Max just seemed to go out there and do a job. Steve Montgomery, the manager of the Sioux City Explorers, or a guest in the latest edition uh, of the Inside Pitch. I mentioned uh, five playoff appearances now for the Explorers since you took over as manager in 2014. Uh, most in the American Association. I know we've talked about this uh, you know, a bit over the last uh, couple of years, but uh, just kind of what, what does that say to you about what, what the coaching staff yourself, the, the players, the organization, just the strides that have been made in Sioux City uh, from, from 2014 well, to today? first of all, we wouldn't be able to do it without the support of my owner, um, John Roost, and and our front office staff, um, you know, we may not, um, you know, be a big organization. I think everybody knows that we're probably the smallest organization in the American Association and the smallest demographic. But you know, we've been able to we've been able to find players that buy into not only winning baseball, but you know, winning and putting sometimes the team ahead of their individual stats. And I, I tell them it's an individualized game because stats are going to go beside your name. But we have to um, we have to be winning as well. No one's going to watch and no scouts are going to go watch or, or, you know, watch it on the Internet when you're 40 and 60. Um, they, they want people that are playing uh, meaningful baseball and in pressure situations. And you got to win to be in those kind of – those kind of situations. And, um, you know, since 14, it was, it was hard the first couple years of changing the culture because the culture of the program was, uh, was losing. But, you know, through the hard work of myself, Bobby Post, um, you know, and Matt Pazzarelli, who was my hitting coach till, uh, 2019 and now Derek Wolf, um, you know, we were, we've been able to change that culture and you got to credit some guys that have been with me a long time too, like a Nate Sampson. Um, Nate, the leadership he supplies inside of that clubhouse, he's like he's like the Reggie Abercrombie of Winnipeg, and uh, he he supplies leadership. He knows when to get in someone's butt, and uh, he knows when I'm upset that I don't have to go out there and say anything. He's going to say it for me. And if you don't have that kind of leadership inside the clubhouse, um, you know you can easily get a couple uh, of bad eggs in, in in that. And if there's a couple bad eggs, it's going to rot the rest of them. 
You mentioned somebody that uh, you know, I think you know deserves maybe maybe more credit uh, on, on a larger scale. But uh, I had the chance to talk to him a little bit last year when uh, the Explorers came up. But Derek Wolf has been with you guys for quite some time now, and uh, uh, just kind of tell us about the impact he's had uh, on and off the field for you guys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Derek. You know, he's a he's a uh, hitting coach down here in Ajuco. He was my bench coach back in 2019, and um, we elevated him into the hitting coach role. And um, you know, he's a guy that you know, wears many hats for us. You know, if, if I need, you know, we're, we're very short staffed. I think everybody knows that. And, uh, you know, if, uh, if we got to pick, you know, there's nothing for me to be working on the field after a game. It's nothing for me to be working before the game with something in the front office and stuff like that. Why, you know, we just, we just do what we need to do to get the job done. It doesn't matter who does it. And, uh, you know, Derek's one of those guys and, and Bobby, my pitching coach as well, are, are two individuals that if we, if we are, if we need something done, they're the first two to say, okay, I got it, or, you know, let's do it together or something like that. And, um, you know, we'll go out and repair a mound after the game. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll help the clubby with laundry while he's over there. I'll get the laundry started. So, um, you know, we just pick and choose, and, you know, we help each other out, and uh, it just is what it is, you know. And um, we know when, you know, when the next day what our goal is. We put a scouting report together. We do all that, and we'll try to win a baseball game couple changes for the American Association. Uh, I guess maybe the, the most uh, structural change, uh, the divisions have been realigned and uh, kind of the older uh, legacy type teams, the, the Explorers, the Sioux Falls Canaries are going to come back here with Winnipeg and Fargo, Lincoln and Kansas City are going to be part of that group as well. Just kind of your thoughts on shifting to uh, an east-west split and um, you know competing directly uh, with some different teams here than you have maybe in the past. Whew. I think our division, in my opinion, got a lot harder. I can tell you that. Um, you know, you, I, I find it to be the gauntlet division. You know, you have notoriously Winnipeg that puts a very good product on the field. Um, Fargo has been strong over the last three years. Um, you know, Sioux Falls, um, you know, Mike does an unbelievable job. Mike is a solo coach. Mike does everything himself. And I can't imagine not having a staff and doing what he does. It's incredible. And my hat's always off to Mike Myers. Always seems to put up competitive, um, bunch on the field and uh then you go you know sioux city i always say sioux city is what sioux city is you know what you get with us and uh you know obviously what kansas city has done over the last three or four years with joe Kelly down there and uh you know he does a fantastic job seems to have you know uh 42 big leaguers on that team and uh um and then uh you know you go down to lincoln and um you know uh he, he did a fabulous job last year um you know coming in so late in the season, um, you know, with the departure of James Frisbee, and uh, he was able to keep them competitive for a very long time. And uh, I know he's gonna, I know he's gonna put another good product on the field. So, you know, and then you go to that other side, and I, I think it's a huge competitive advantage, in my opinion. I really do, because how long, how long are we gonna be staying on the bus? That division, our division, is gonna be on the bus. All their division is a lot of commuters. So the only time they're really going to be leaving home is when they come visit us. So I find it to be a huge advantage for the West, but it just is what it is. You mentioned Kansas City. It's um, they've they've almost kind of raised the bar. You mentioned the the volume of ex big leaguers they've had on their team really since the two thousand. 18 season, and I think, in, you know, for a long time, it was maybe the the St. Pauls or the Fargos or the, or the Winnipeg. You kind of look to to that model as, all right, this is the type of team that you need to compete with. But it almost seems like Kansas City has has elevated that a notch, and um, that's kind of what you've got to go up against if you want to try and go all the way and win a championship. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. They've raised the bar. Um, you know, you think about, I think since 18, um, I, I yeah, ever since 18. When the division alignments have been, it's always been Kansas City and Sioux City in that West Division, um, or I'll call whatever you want to call it, the South Division Championship. So, um, you know, in 18, they got us, and uh, um, 19, no, 18, they got us, 19, we got them, and in 21, they got us. So, um, you know, hopefully we can uh, make a run again this year. Obviously, the divisional format, there's four teams that are going to make the playoffs. And don't think for a second that one, that number one seed picking their opponent ain't going to play into whoever they pick. 
And uh, that kind of ties into the next question. Uh, so is the you know as tough as these divisions, especially the West, kind of uh, look here on paper, and uh, just kind of how those organizations have been historically. Uh, four out of six teams do make it, so your your at least your chances from the start of the year of getting to the postseason are are, are maybe a little bit higher. Uh, how much have you kind of factored that in, or, or how much of a role do you think that's going to play? Uh, I would imagine it can maybe allow you and some of the other managers to uh, be a little more patient, maybe uh, give some veteran guys a chance if maybe they get off to a slow starts at the beginning of the year well yeah I, I you know i always when i'm talking about veteran players i always like you know i tell them all the time that the 100 pit the 100 at bat mark is really my mark that if you're not doing anything by 100 at bat so we're looking at 25 games so i don't like to make too many decisions prior to that point but you know at the same time i and i think you've been around me steve long enough to know this game one is is as important as game 100 because how many times do we miss out on the playoffs by one game? So um, we got to take every game with seriousness. And uh, but yeah, I mean, you can now that you know that four teams make the playoffs, you can stay relaxed a little bit and let someone kind of work through the kinks. But at the same time, you know, I think any manager in this league is always trying to improve. And uh, you know, if we can if we can improve at that point of the season, whether it's 18 games in or 88 games in, I think every manager is going to try to improve. And uh, the, the other change, or I guess they're going to bring this back, is the international tiebreaker rule uh, where they're going to put a runner in second base uh, if the game is tied going into extra innings. I know Major League Baseball uh, tinkered with that last year. Uh, the American Association had it a little bit in, uh, I believe it was 2014 and 2015 in the interleague games. Uh, I know a lot of the, the managers generally are not in favor of this, but uh, maybe a good thing this year, just given how we saw uh, so much of the experienced pitching uh, kind of get picked up last year and, uh, and teams are just kind of thinner on arms in general, that maybe this could be a, a benefit, at least in this season. Well, I, you know, I, I, I think something has to be done. And obviously, um, you know, my son's been involved in travel baseball and um, everything down in, the, down in the state of Florida. I like the rule of what Perfect Game does, and they load the bases and say one out. Because then I think it's a lot more strategy involved. Okay, Can you, do, you, do you bunt them home? Do you play for two? Do you, you know, with a runner on, on second, you know what I mean? We played that back in 2015, and I can tell you personally that once, once I, I, Rob Wirt had to get 12 wins that way because he would come in, get a couple strikeouts, and then we'd bunt him the third, they would walk a guy, and then we'd bunt him home. And then, so it's a huge advantage for the home team. And the thing is, is that almost every manager, uh, and even when I'm doing it down here with my son's team, when there's a runner on second base, nobody out, well, I, I don't bunt. I let them swing away. And uh, I'm playing for multiple runs so that it puts the pressure back on them. And then a lot of times what ends up happening is you don't score. And now uh, before we let you go here, I uh, just did want to ask you about your son, Tef, and I believe he's committed to uh, Iowa Western uh, Community College. He's just having a fantastic a season uh, bouncing back. I know we had a, a little bout with Mono there uh, uh, last season, but uh, what can you tell us about uh, the way his career is uh, progressing here as he approaches his college season? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, he's a senior in high school this year. So, um, you know, he is committed to Iowa Western. He, he really loved the, the culture there, the, the development and everything. Um, fantastic schools with SEC, qual, SEC quality facilities. So it was really, it's really exciting to see. Um, you know, he's in his senior year right now. Uh, you know, he's, he's doing good. He has, you know, 20 innings pitched. I think, you know, 9, 10 hits, uh, 9, 10 walks and, um, you know, almost two strikeouts per inning pitched. He's been up to 94. So, you know, he's garnered some Major League Baseball interest. But, you know, it, it'll be interesting because the draft and follow is now back, and all the scouts know that he is committed to a junior college. So we'll see if one pulls the trigger in the later rounds. You know, I've, I've been telling Major League scouts the same thing and I, uh, that I tell everybody. Unless it's life-changing money, he's going to school. So, um you know, we'll see what happens, but, you know, I'm super proud of him and, and uh, you know, his development and his work ethic. His work ethic, uh, I wish I had that as a child, and um, you know, and uh, but, you know, that's the benefit of having a dad that's involved in pro ball. You know, they kind of understand what's going on. Well, outstanding stuff. Uh, wishing Tef and certainly all the best here the rest of his senior season. Uh, appreciate the insight as always. Uh, great to catch up with you and uh, just looking forward to seeing you once the uh, regular season gets underway. I can't wait, Steve. Uh, thanks for everything you do once again, and I appreciate you having me on the show.